This video looks at adoption studies, which are part of the methodology for the biological approach. Adoption studies look at the impact of nurture on children who are raised by parents who are not their biological parents. Because there is no biological connection between the adopted parent and the child, if the child grows up to share the adopted parents' traits or the traits of adopted brothers and sisters um, who are biologically related to the adopted parents, then all of these traits are probably produced by nurture. It's difficult to resist the Harry Potter reference here, but Harry is obviously adopted by a muggle family and he shows a magical talent. Now, this suggests that the magical ability is not down to nurture because he couldn't have learned this from his muggle family, but rather down to nature, especially as we know that both of Harry's parents are wizards. Adoption studies are made valid if the researchers have information about the child's biological parents, because if the child grows up with traits that resemble the adoptive parents more than the biological parents, then this again is evidence that the traits are down to nurture. So, for example, if we were doing an adoption study investigating intelligence, if the adopted child scored just as high on the IQ test of the adopted parents, then this suggests that the intelligence is down to nurture. If the adopted child's biological parents score very differently as well, then this further strengthens the conclusion that it is upbringing and not genetics that's responsible for intelligence. However, if the adopted child's IQ scores don't resemble the adoptive family, then this suggests that nurture isn't strong enough influence on intelligence. And if the adopted child's IQ is closely related to the biological parent, then this weakens the idea that it would be nurture and strengthens the idea that biological uh, that, that there's a biological influence on intelligence and therefore is down to nature. Now, it's really important to point out a misconception here. Many students get very confused because you also look at twin studies and think that adoption studies are when twins are separated. That is not the case. Adoption studies don't involve twins. That's something totally different because these days twins are almost always put up for adoption together and not separated. Adoption studies are usually measured using a correlational technique. This means that they're looking for relationships between variables and therefore not cause and effect. And the researchers are looking for a correlation between the behaviour of the children and their parents. So if the correlation with an adopted parent is higher than with a biological parent, that would suggest that there is a support there for whatever it is that they're looking at being down to nurture the environment and upbringing. However, if the correlation with the adopted parent is lower than the correlation with the biological parent, then this gives us strong evidence that that particular behaviour is down to nature and therefore genes. We need to be able to evaluate adoption studies as a methodology and as a research technique. Now, adoption studies have to use adopted children as their sample, and this is a group that isn't representative of all other children, therefore there's generalizability problems. For one thing, these children have been separated from their biological parents, and that may be through a tragic circumstance or because their parents gave them up due to difficult circumstances. So psychologists like John Balby argue that children are really badly affected if they're separated from their mother, and therefore this this would make these children even more, uh, even less representative of children in general, and they're causing even more issues with generalising the findings. In terms of reliability, reliability as well, adoptions are handled by charities or state agencies, and psychologists have to be opportunistic in recruiting these children for adoption studies. There may well be extraneous variables in play. So, for example, children may need to be adopted for different reasons. So, for example, immigrant children or abandoned children compared to those children who've died. And those circumstances will all act as extraneous variables having an effect on the results. Some children may have spent time as orphans in their early upbringing, and this may affect them more so. Or they may have been fostered into other families before the current family which adopted them. And again, these will have influences on the child as they're growing up. In terms of application, adoption studies tell us whether good parenting can correct bad genes. So children whose biological parents may have been drug addicts, alcoholics or criminals may get a second chance if they're adopted by families with healthy lifestyles. And adoption studies tells us how likely this is. These studies also tell us how ordinary families may raise children to not repeat the mistakes they made, like turning to crime or underachieving at school. In terms of validity, there are a lot of confounding variables in play within adoption studies. So adoption agencies try to match children to their adopted family as similar as possible to the biological family in terms of race, ethnicity and class, etc. And this makes it even more difficult to see if it's the upbringing that's at play here. The idea that your upbringing entirely shapes the person that you grow into is an environmental determinism. That means that it ignores all other factors apart from environment. 
Most psychologists today are not determinists. They think that people are influenced by a mixture of environmental and genetic influences. And this limits the usefulness of adoption studies because however an adoption, adopted child grows up, there will always be the possibility that he or she would have grown up that way anyway, no matter how they were raised. After all, lots of children raised by their biological parents grow up to be completely different from their parents in many ways. And then finally, ethics. Children can't consent to be studies, but, ado but adoption studies usually proceed with the presumptive consent of the adoptive parents and, where possible, the biological parents as well. The children's anonymity is preserved and this therefore respects their privacy. There is always a danger that adoption studies may create rifts within families, drawing attention to differences between adopted children, their brothers and sisters, or drawing unfortunate comparisons to the children's biological parents. Now, this can create a self-doubt within the child, which is a risk that the British Psychological Society does warn about. And it's therefore that very careful debriefing is needed within this sort of research. Social responsibility is important within ethical research, given that thousands of children are adopted every single year. Adoption studies do benefit society by helping us to understand how much or how little adoptive parents can do for the children that they're raising.